may be the first time I've ever come into that kind of music. That was very cool. Um, the, I, I realize that the topic of my talk, Will Science Kill God, is a little bit ponderous, so uh, I'm actually shocked anybody's here, so thank you for coming. Um, I write novels with recurring themes of religion, faith, and man's quest for the divine. Um, and I said earlier today that I accepted this invitation to, to speak at Web Summit because I believe that a lot of you, those who are creating technologies of the future, will do as much to shape the future of human spirituality as will all of the world's religious leaders combined. For centuries, science and religion have both vied to be that infallible source from which we draw our truth. And depending on our upbringings, our own, um, our own source of miracles and truth may be uh, the pages of Holy Scripture, or it may be the pages of scientific journals. Uh, as a child, I had some trouble finding my way. Uh, my mother was a deeply devout Christian church organist, and my father was a professor of mathematics and probability. So I, I was lost from day one. Uh, to give you the idea of the outspoken piousness of my mother, I actually brought something of hers to show you. Uh, for years as I grew up, she drove me to school and to soccer practice in a bright red Volvo turbo station wagon uh, with a very unique license plate. And I actually brought it. Here is my mother's license plate. Kyrie. I'm sure as I can tell that you're laughing, uh, one of you laughed. Um, this, is the, this is the Latin transliteration of the evocative case for the Greek word of Lord. It is the most common word in the Byzantine Rite Christian liturgy, which is what makes it so hilarious. Um, my, my mom uh, was not at all shy about her religious beliefs. And my father was equally enthusiastic about his passion for mathematics, uh, so much so that he penned 13 internationally best-selling textbooks, and I'm betting a large number of you actually used my dad's textbooks uh, in school. And if you're wondering what it did for my popularity at school to have a father who essentially wrote everyone's math homework, uh, it was not good. I had very few dates. Um, Living in a house with a God-fearing mother and a math-crazed father was a little bit schizophrenic. At dinner time, my mother would say grace and thank the Lord for all the blessings that had been bestowed upon us, and then my father would promptly take the baby carrots on our plate and use them to teach us about conic sections. Um, I learned at a young age that depending on how I cut my carrot, I could create a cross-section that was a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, or if I were really skilled with my knife, the holy grail of all dinnertime carrot cuts, the hyperbola. I did that once, too. When we went out for pizza, my dad would gather us around the pizza pie, and that is pie, P-I, of course. He would teach us about degrees of arc, uh, areas and circles, and I cannot tell you how embarrassing it was to stand in line at Romeo's Pizza with my father and his brand new Texas Instruments calculator, and you're probably too young to remember what these things looked like. They were giant, they cost $800. They were computers that you sort of held in front of you. And he would use this calculator to figure out whether it was more cost effective to buy a large, two smalls, maybe a small and a medium, you know. So uh, this from the guy who wrote Advanced Mathematics. By the way, my father's license plate when I was growing up, I brought that one too. Here it is, okay. I guess we found the right crowd. Uh, my dad's a huge fan of the metric system, and America's total failure to adopt it uh, still bothers him on a deeply spiritual level. Uh, he's, he's, at, he's getting up there in years, and I said, hey, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm going over to Ireland. He said, please tell me they've fully switched over to the metric system. So when I go home, I'm going to tell him that all the Irish pubs now serve pints of Guinness in 473 milliliter glasses. So he will be overjoyed. Um, anyhow, growing up, despite my parents' Curie metric conflict and my rather paradoxical upbringing, I was quite happy in these two worlds of science and religion. But once I matured to the all-knowing age of 13, I started to realize that these two different worldviews posed all kinds of contradictions. The Bible said God created the universe in seven days, but in school I just learned about the Big Bang. The Bible said God made Adam and Eve and all the animals but I had gone to the Boston Museum of Science and seen fossils and heard about how everything evolved. 
And so I asked a priest, how should I reconcile these inconsistencies? Essentially, I asked him, which story is true? And this particular priest replied, nice boys don't ask that question. <laughs> At that very moment, I became fascinated with the interplay between science and religion. Thousands of years ago, when science was in its primordial stages, the ancients developed an extensive pantheon of gods and goddesses to explain just about everything they didn't understand about their natural world. Thunder, lightning, earthquakes, infertility, the movement of the tides, plagues, even love. Thunder, the ancient gods decided, or the ancients decided, was caused by Thor, angrily throwing lightning bolts. The ebb and flow of the oceans was attributed to the shifting moods of Poseidon, and pandemic disease was a plague sent by a vengeful god. This kind of spirituality is known as the god of the gaps. That is, when there were gaps in the ancients' understanding of the world, they filled those gaps with God. Over time, however, the progress of science began removing those gaps, and the pantheon of gods started to shrink. For example, we now understand the science of thunder and lightning, and Thor has been banished as a false god and a foolish myth of an ignorant time. We no longer turn to God for answers as to why the tides flow or why plagues spread. Science has answered those questions. We now turn to God for the answers to a handful of questions that science has never been able to answer. Where do we come from? Why are we here? What happens when we die? And in asking these questions, we realize that we, just like the ancients, still worship the God of the gaps. We still call upon God to fill the gaps in our understanding of the human experience. Nonetheless, those gaps have shrunk dramatically over time. Nowadays, with the exception of the big existential questions, which are still very much the realm of God, science rather than religion is the lens through which we increasingly see our world. When there's, er when there's an earthquake, for example, most of us, including the deeply devout, will frame that event as a geologic release of tectonic pressure, not a punishment sent by a wrathful God. Christianity's long-held belief that God placed mankind at the center of the universe was disproven by the scientific discoveries of Copernicus and Galileo, who proved that God not only failed to place mankind at the center of the universe, he didn't even place us at the center of our own solar system. A similar thing happened to the biblical account of Adam and Eve, who, if you choose to read the scripture literally, God created as fully formed human beings, who then procreated and spawned the entire human race, including all of the different ethnicities, with none of the problems of inbreeding. To my mind, the story of Adam and Eve simply does not hold up in the face of the fossil record, Charles Darwin, and evolutionary science. I have learned too much through science to believe that particular myth, even if I desperately want to. If we look at this trend of science eating away at the claims of religion, we have to wonder if the same process of demystification and dereligionization will continue into the future, extending itself perhaps even to these final few existential questions. I can't help but wonder what happens someday if a biologist employs advances in computing, genetics, and biochemistry to create a concoction in a petri dish from which suddenly springs life. In that moment, abruptly, that Sistine Chapel image of God reaching down to infuse mankind with life starts to look a bit like an ancient Roman drawing of Minerva springing from the head of Jupiter, a notion that we now find antiquated and obsolete. And what about the question, why are we here? For centuries, religions have taught us that humans are special in God's eyes, that we are God's supreme creation, and that we hold the highest place in God's heart above all the other creatures. In light of that, I can't help but wonder about the spiritual repercussions of the following scenario. Imagine sometime in the future a genetic scientist uses quantum computers to model the entire human evolutionary process, maybe even gene by gene. And she uses that model to extrapolate and predict the future changes to our DNA over the next thousand years, only to discover that human beings evolve into something quite different or that we're destined for extinction. What does that knowledge do 
to our relationship with our Creator? What does it do to our spiritual sense of our place in the cosmos to realize that our species, like the lungfish or Homo erectus, is really just a passing phase on the evolutionary continuum, a fleeting grace note on the scale of time? And what about the biggest of all existential questions, that question that inspires even the most skeptical of us to open the door to God, even a crack? The question, what happens when we die? In that final moment, do all of our hopes and dreams and memories simply disintegrate and evaporate into the ether? It seems logical. After all, our memories are simply a series of electrical charges stored in a brain whose power cable is just cut. And yet religion, all religions, promise there is indeed something beyond the moment of death. Some of you may recall the 1990 movie Flatliners about a group of medical students experimenting with near-death experiences, letting themselves die for a full minute before having their colleagues bring them back from the dead to discuss what they had experienced in the afterlife. It's a great premise, uh, one that will probably not remain fiction forever. At some point in the future, medical science may well develop a way to enable humans to die temporarily and to stay dead long enough that when we return, we have some serious quantifiable knowledge about the afterlife, or, heaven forbid, its total absence. But if there is an afterlife, will Christians and Muslims and Hindus and atheists all have different death experiences? And if not, if they all have identical experiences, what does that say about the new, unique claims of each religion regarding the afterlife? I'm also curious about artificial intelligence and synthetic consciousness. If we create an AI machine that eventually becomes conscious, what happens if we leave that machine all alone in the dark, telling it nothing about who created it or why? Letting this artificial consciousness float in the digital void, much like we earthbound humans float in the void of space. Will this machine start to ask itself how it came to be? Will it develop a profound curiosity about its maker? Will it go so far as to invent histories and mythologies to explain how it might have been created? Simply stated, if we build a conscious machine and we don't tell it how and why it was created, will it want to know? And if it does want to know, can we conclude that one of the byproducts of consciousness is a need to define our creator? and that even an artificial mind so craves the comfort of knowing its maker that a machine would rather create a fiction than to admit it just doesn't know. I write a character, Robert Langdon, who is quite comfortable living on that dividing line between science and religion. If Robert Langdon were here, he would tell us science and religion are simply two different languages attempting to tell the same story. A big part of me believes that, too, even though most of the evidence is to the contrary. Historically, science and religion have functioned less as partners than as mortal enemies. I mentioned earlier how scientific progress has undermined religious authority, but make no mistake about it, religious authority has been no friend to science. In the 8th century, the greatest learning center on Earth was Baghdad. For 500 years, the outpouring of scientific innovation from Baghdad was like nothing the world had ever seen. And we still use their scientific inventions today, still calling them by their Arabic names. Algebra, algorithms, alchemy, chemistry, ciphers, and my father's favorite, the number zero. Then in the 11th century, a religious leader named Hamid al-Ghazali wrote a series of persuasive texts declaring mathematics the philosophy of the devil and urging that scientific study to be replaced by the theological study. Almost overnight, scientific investigation was, was replaced by religious revelation, and the entire scientific movement collapsed there. <coughs> Christian clerics mounted similar religious assaults on science, directed at Bruno, Galileo, and Copernicus either burning, imprisoning, or discrediting some of science's most brilliant minds and ideas. And this is still happening today. Recently in Madrid, the World Federation of Catholic Medical Associations declared war on genetic medicine, proclaiming that science lacks soul 
and therefore should be restrained by the church. In my own country, there are science teachers attempting to teach evolution who are besieged, besieged and physically threatened by angry parents demanding equal billing for creationism and for Adam and Eve. About a decade ago, the United States set out to build the largest particle collider in the world, the superconducting supercollider, which had the potential to unveil the very moment of creation, and yet ironically was slated to be built in Texas in the heart of America's Bible Belt. The project was killed due in large part to cost overruns, but also due in part to vocal leaders like Representative Sherwood Bollert, who made his now famous declaration on the floor of the Senate Bollert said, I doubt anyone believes that the most pressing issues facing this nation include an insufficient understanding of the creation of the universe. Now, I beg to differ with that one. So where is it all leading? Will science and religion ever learn to get along? And if not, if they keep doing battle, will there ever be a winner? If you look at the two players, Science and religion are as different from each other as they could possibly be. Religions over the centuries have remained unchanged in their fundamental beliefs and tenets. In many ways, that is their strength and attractiveness, that religions have stayed steadfast, self-assured, consistent, and timeless. Science and technology, on, their hand, on the other hand, have changed dramatically over time. Now scientific progress is happening so rapidly that our minds can barely keep up. It took early humans over a million years to go from discovering fire to inventing a wheel. Then it took only 2,000 years to invent the printing press. Then a mere 200 years to build a telescope. In the 200 years that followed that, we jumped from the telescope to a steam locomotive and then in another 200 years, from the steam locomotive to the space shuttle. And then it took only two decades for us to start modifying our own DNA. We now measure scientific progress in months, experiencing quantum leaps at a mind-boggling pace. It will not take long before the fastest supercomputer of today looks like an abacus in the face of emerging technologies, or before most today's most advanced surgical methods start to look barbaric to us, or before easy, even using a physical power cable starts to seem as quaint as the days of using a candle. The early Greeks had to look back centuries to study ancient culture. We need to look back only a single generation to find those who lived without the majority of technologies that we now take for granted. The timeline of human development is compressing. The space that separates ancient and modern is shrinking to nothing at all. The technologies of the future will enable our species to achieve, achieve things we cannot yet even imagine. Uh, they will give us new powers of creativity and exploration. They will radically enhance the way we interact with humans. Uh, excuse me, interact as humans. <laughs> with a little luck, particle physicists might even make contact with a parallel universe. I know that CERN uh, here in Europe was uh, talking about that recently. Biological engineers might unlock the untapped potential of the human mind. And if that happens, who knows what the future of spirituality will look like. The real question facing us now, I think, is whether or not our technologies and philosophies will keep pace with, other, with each other. As our technologies race forward, will our philosophies keep pace? Will our moralities evolve fast enough to address the questions that we can't even yet imagine? Will our ethics help us responsibly to wield the dazzling tools that we're now creating? Religion and faith in all of its traditions and forms around the world will, of course, play an influential role in this process. It always has. And so as I think about the future, I find myself wondering what the role of our existing gods will be in the philosophies of tomorrow. Now, this will be a personal decision for each of us. And as we make those decisions, I only hope that we can remember this. There is nothing in our DNA that predetermines our beliefs. We are not born into this world believing that a particular God is the true God. We are born into a culture. We worship the gods of our parents. 
If all of us in this room had been born in the mountains of Tibet, most of us would be Buddhists, and we would hold on to that Buddhist philosophy with the same passion that we now hold on to our current faiths. We worship the gods of our parents. It is truly that simple. The world is getting smaller every day, and now more than ever, there is enormous danger in believing that we are infallible, that our version of the truth is absolute, and that everyone who does not think like we do is wrong and therefore an enemy. For our own survival, it is critical that we live with open minds, that we educate ourselves, that we ask difficult questions, and above all, that we engage in dialogue, especially with those who whose ideas are not our own. And so in closing, in the name of dialogue and sharing ideas, I want to acknowledge that what has brought us here this afternoon in this room is the uniquely human instinct to connect in person, to, live, to learn from one another, and to share ideas, and to engage in dialogue. I want to thank the Web Summit for making this dialogue possible, and I want to thank all of you for coming today. Thank you.